Welcome to Salon Talks. I am Mary Elizabeth Williams, and this is Tina Brown. She is a journalist and editor, a best-selling author. She's been the editor of Tatler, Vanity Fair, Talk, The New Yorker. She was the founding editor of The Daily Beast, and she's the founder of the Women in the World Summit. She's the author of The Vanity Fair Diaries, which is such a great juicy read, and The Diana Chronicles, and now on the cusp of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee and the 25th anniversary of the death of Diana, Brown has published her latest instant bestseller, The Palace Papers, Inside the House of Windsor, The Truth and the Turmoil. Hi, Tina, how are you? Very well, and it's good to see you again since my last book. So hi, Mary. It's a pleasure. I was, I, I've told you I love this book. It is so entertaining. It is so just, but also deeply moving. Um, and insightful and you know when you think you've, you've read everything and know everything about this family I am obsessed with them uh, you find out more you obviously are someone who has been involved with writing about thinking about covering this family for pretty much your entire career Tina it's been 15 years since your last book about Diana I really am curious what at this point surprised you what did you learn that you hadn't learned before well, I guess what really fascinates me about the family is the kind of recurring themes that sort of drive this family. And, you know, it was one of the things that made me kind of gobsmacked, quite frankly, when when Megan said that, you know, she didn't know anything about this family, because you can see these patterns constantly reasserting themselves. I mean, one of the one of the patterns that reinserts, of course, is the whole issue of the second son or the second child, you know, uh, how difficult it is to be anything but the monarch in that family it's bad enough and hard enough and tough enough and challenging enough to be the monarch but to be the kind of the rest of them not fun and i guess what really surprised me in a sense was just how difficult it really is you know how sort of the grind of that royal duty thing the fact that they never feel they have enough money because they're living on the sovereign grant, usually of about 250 a year, thousand a year in a palace. But at the same time, you know, they can't leave that place. They, they can't have their own lives, really. They have to be perfect all the time without the kind of rewards. It's really a kind of not a fun existence, really. I mean, there are a lot of privilege. Let's make no mistake about it. There's an, I mean, you know, Crimea River in the sense that, you know, they, yeah, they live very nicely, etc. But they have no freedom, really. And freedom in the end is, is the most uh, precious thing of all. You describe it very aptly as all status, no quo. And uh, I think a lot of us don't understand that. And you certainly um, seem to indicate that Megan did not understand that, that uh, this is also something that other members of the family have butt up against. Uh, Prince Edward, you described that as well, where there, if you are it's one of the quote unquote lesser royals, it is all status and no quo. You are supposed to not use your royalty as a platform. You're just supposed to somehow, I don't know, magically be rich or something. And there are so many restrictions. You can't just, uh, Megan suddenly can't be accepting gifts. She can't be accepting gift bags. She can't get the swag anymore, but she also kind of can't work. What? What do we not understand about that that life? What do you think Megan didn't understand about what the restrictions are and what the expectations are? Well, I think most of the first thing she didn't really understand is that as big as she was getting on the world stage and she got bigger and bigger and she wanted that, she wanted to be a very famous celebrated woman all her life she had wanted that. But once she entered the royal family, it is a bit like a secular version of taking the veil. As big as she got on the outside, she had to kind of shrink down on the inside to fit herself into this tight glove of, of the royal family and not have a voice of her own. That was the thing that really uh, she just could not accept, that she didn't have a voice of their own because the role of, the, of, of one of the members of the royal family is essentially to be scaffolding. <laughs> You're scaffolding on which you know, for the sovereign, essentially, you are not supposed to have your own point of view. You, you, are an, you are a representational figure who goes out representing the royal family and doesn't have a point of view about, you know, anything, really. I mean, after 70 years of being on the throne, we don't know anything about what the Queen thinks about anything. We know a whole lot about what Charles thinks, which has got him a lot of criticism in the past. But he's going to have to really dial that back, of course, when he does become king. And, you know, frankly, every time 
one of the younger ones or the other ones makes an opinion, it becomes a controversy that everybody ends up, you know, apologizing for for the next sort of six months. So that she found, I think, the most untenable thing, the kind of repression of herself into this structure of monarchy. Very hard thing to do unless you've really signed up for it, bought into it, and probably enter it at a younger, less formed phase, because Megan was 36, you know, with fully formed career, you know, woman with a very big career, you know, who herself had already, you know, she'd earned her own living since the age of 21. She suddenly was dependent on her husband, which she'd never really been since she, you know, since she left home. And, uh, and, and frankly, a, a husband who was dependent on the bank of dad, his, you know, Charles, uh, and dependent on granny, the queen, for a roof over his head. It's like, well, we have nowhere to live or which one of the palaces, uh, the sort of minor, the minor houses, as it were, in the palace state, can we live in? You know, this is like very disempowering if you are, you know, a woman of independence. Right, and if this is not something that you know how to necessarily finesse and being being this independent person being an outsider and also as you point out uh, coming into this family at a moment that was not optimal for someone who was biracial who was american who was divorced at a moment when the british public was not necessarily receptive to someone like that was truly truly difficult but also she was not someone who was prepared to figure out how to play that system I mean, I think actually uh, it was all difficult. Yes, I mean, the British press are very difficult uh, to handle because they are extremely iconoclastic, uh, snarky, uh, you know, invasive, all of the things that, you know, that she did experience. And the family, you know, look, the, you know, there's only 8% diversity in the palace. And uh, certainly she must have felt very much alone. You know, there was no one who looked like Meghan in, in, in that family or indeed very few people, you know, at the palace itself. So those were all real, real problems that she had. I guess where I take issue is the fact that at the age of 36, after a big career where she had always been known for doing her homework, she didn't do enough homework about what was going to be expected of her because you know, this is a big step to move, make, to mar marry into that family. And were it to go wrong, which it did, uh, very, you know, very disruptive, you know, for everything. And there was a great deal of disappointment, really, in both the family and in the country, essentially, that someone who had been in sort of embraced as being this extraordinary sort of breakthrough uh, bride, if you like, uh, you know, entering the family, there was a great deal of delight that she was bringing this kind of youthfulness and, and diversity and all of the things that she brought in, in, into the family that actually that it, that it didn't work. I mean, it was a sort of painful, a painful failure, if you like, for the family as much as it was for, for, her, for Harry. And as you point out in the book, again and again, I think one of the recurring themes that I found really beautiful and touching in this book is this is a book that's about marriage. This is so deeply a book about marriages. And when you look at the marriage of, of Harry and Meghan, you point out that they are, they are truly in love, but that they also ignite certain characteristics in each other that can then perpetuate um, real fear, real anxiety. They both are very open about some of the struggles that they've had and can't necessarily protect each other from those kinds of struggles. In a comparative way, when you look at William and Kate, who do seem very much on the same track and are seemingly a very well-oiled machine. Well, that's right. I mean, they definitely reinforce each other in, in their own insecurities, I think. And, and uh, I mean, Harry was uh, a tremendously fragile man, you know, before, long before he married. And he's made no secret of the fact that, you know, he had tremendous pain, anxiety, and, and, and after effects of, of course, the tragic death of his mother when he was only 12 years old leaving him with a, not only the wound of that, but also the bitterness of how she'd been treated by the press and, and by the family. So, you know, there was a lot of, uh, of roiling, you know, discontents in Harry. And when he came out of the army, uh, where he had been very happy because it provided him that structure and kind of held him tight, he sort of fell apart, really. And But at the same time, you know, he also had a lot of rivalry, really, with his brother beginning, because though they were very, very close, once Harry came out of the army, their paths began to diverge. I mean, Diana had always brought up and raised her boys to be the same. But of course, they weren't the same. You know, uh, William was going to be king and Harry wasn't. And at a certain point when William came out of the army in his 20s and, 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 and William was went well placed then on his course for his destiny, began, their paths began to separate and 
Harry really began to feel what it meant to be the one who was second. And he didn't like it at all. I mean, he felt marginalized. He felt that he had his own great gifts and, and as he does and, and, and uh, things that he could do that he didn't feel he was being properly sort of positioned to do and that his brother was getting all of the best sort of assignments and, 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 and sort of um, underpinning. And um, actually then he launched, you know, his Invictus Games, which was his kind of version of the sort of wounded warrior, uh, you know, uh, sort of special Olympics for veterans. And it was enormously successful initiative and, and it's become an annually very successful initiative. And actually that gave Harry a great sense of, you know, I can, I can do stuff that's, that's really big and meaningful on the global stage. I can be a global humanitarian in a sense, I shouldn't be in this position of sort of number two who's jostling to, you know, I can actually, I'm bigger than that. And while these discontents were roiling, that's when he really met Megan. And Megan really reinforced his sense that he wasn't being essentially appreciated enough for his own gifts. And that became a very sort of uh, us against the world uh, uh, kind of team. And it was unfortunate that it became a bitter one, actually, because they felt that together that they just weren't being given the platform that they wanted. But it did ignore the reality of the fact that, you know, Harry isn't going to be king. And, you know, everything from the allocation of budget to the, you know, the kinds of uh, appearances and stuff you're booked to do are obviously going to be second dips. I mean, they just are. Uh, and, um, you know, actually, the Queen Gate was, I think, extremely uh, supportive and imaginative of the things that she offered Meghan. I mean, she offered her vice chairmanship of the... Um, or was it vice presidency of the Commonwealth, the Queen's Commonwealth Trust, which is a huge thing for the Queen to do because the Queen's, you know, passion all her life has been the Commonwealth. And she really saw how Meghan and Harry could be, the Sussexes could become the, the face of, you know, the, the, the Commonwealth on, in, in her stead. And um, that was a great sort of uh, both a compliment to Meghan and, and uh, you know, belief in her because she'd done, she'd shown herself to be extraordinarily good in these, in these public engagements. I mean, everyone, there was no ever no criticism of how Meghan comported herself in these public engagements she's actually was actually terrific at it some would argue too good at it which is what harry felt that there was jealousy about how good she was at it um but the queen also offered her a, made her the you know the patron of the national theater which is also something the queen had done you know all of her life and it was a very big compliment to give that one of her prized uh, patronages to megan and of course a wonderfully fitting one as megan was you know a, 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 an actor and a, you know cared passionately about the arts so I actually think that Megan perhaps underestimated what an amazing opportunity she'd been given really to, 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 to shine in this particular way. And I think it's really ultimately, it was about the lack of financing for it. I mean, she felt that there were much bigger, uh, uh, you know, that the, the, the Netflix kind of entertainment deals and so on was something that she did not want to turn up. I mean, the fact was that, you know, that they wanted both essentially, you know, they wanted to be, able to do these royal things, but also to get major deals, you know, in entertainment. And there was this constant tension of that because it isn't really possible. To, it's not possible to do that and be a member of the royal family because the whole position of the palace is, and I think it's right, is you can't, you know, ultimately you're being leveraged for your, 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 your uh, royal position. You're only being asked to do these things because you are a royal prince or princess. And that means you're leveraging the crown. And there's a conflict of interest. I mean, it's very much like politics. I mean, politicians can't just take major deals and things. It's a conflict of interest. And they wouldn't see that, the Sussexes. You know, they, they really wanted both and they were determined to have both. And at the end, of course, they were so vehement that they wanted both that it, was, it became an either or, or situation. And the truth is you never uh, offer the queen an ultimatum. <laughs> if you say to the queen either or, the queen will say, well, in that case, I suggest you do all, <laughs> right. which is sort of what happened, right, in Mexico. Right, because she's the queen. And yet when you look at what they have, where they are now um, in this moment, it does seem that there is, there is a path for them of maybe a happier life for them as a family in California. But when we think of royal siblings and how badly it can go, of course, I have to think of Andrew, the queen's supposed favorite son, and what happened there, you obviously go into that in the book as well. And one of the things that I, I thought just typified it so beautifully was you used the, you used the word the, the Dunning-Kruger effect for him. It seems that he still does not get it, Tina, that he still 
believes that he oh. can come back from, from this. What is going on there, Tina? And what, what realistically will happen? Well, I mean, honestly, Andrew has, hasn't got the memo that he's canceled. He is canceled. Um, big time. You know, I mean, the Queen could not have made it more clear when she stripped him of all of his military honours. I mean, he was first of all banned, sort of taken out of public life completely after the whole fiasco when he sat down, uh, you know, and did the Emily Maitlis interview. And then, of course, when Virginia Dufresne's uh, allegations were, were, you know, it was, it was such an appalling, appalling uh, allegation uh, of sexual assault. He simply doesn't understand that this just puts him out forever, frankly. And the Queen tried to make that point by stripping him of, the, of, of all of his military uh, uh, assignments, which he had really, really wanted to keep for obvious reasons. And that was a very painful thing for her. She had to cancel her own son, but she did. Uh, but didn't mean it didn't cause her enormous sadness because you know he is very close to her. And of course, uh, recently at the memorial in April for Prince Philip, Everyone was aghast to see her walking down the aisle of the church on the arm of Andrew. Now, that apparently wasn't supposed to happen at all. Andrew was supposed to hand her off at the church door to uh, the dean. And, but instead, he sort of thrust himself into the cameras um, to sort of to, 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 to do this with the queen, which was a horrible optics for the queen. But as far as Andrew considered, you know, that was actually great optics for him. But it's, it's, it's a futile exercise because... Once the queen does uh, pass away, the fact is that Charles is not going to tolerate it. If I were if I were Andrew, I would be house hunting now because, you know, there he sits in um, the former, you know, the queen mother's former home on Windsor Great Park, very near the castle. I don't think that Charles is going to want Andrew cantering around in Windsor Great Park and being photographed all the time in, you know, Windsor, where he is actually very close to London. Andrew needs to move very, very far away. <laughs> No. If I, were, I mean, in, in other eras, Andrew would have been banished to the Scottish borders. And <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, I don't quite know how you stash away a healthy 61 year old who doesn't want to be stashed, but they have an issue with Andrew. Yeah, that's not going to go away. And, you know, you you allude to the fact that there there inevitably will be a change uh, coming sooner rather than later. Uh, Elizabeth has been on the throne for 70 years. She's the third longest reigning monarch in world history. What happens when that moment comes, when there is a change? What does this look like? There are people who, who, who have forever been saying, why do we even still have a monarchy? We have, you know, we have former colonies in in the um, you know in the Caribbean, who are petitioning to end their relationship with the crown, what happens, assuming that the day is coming soon when there is a King Charles? Well, I mean, it's going to be the most seismic moment in English history. I mean, uh, it's going to be a huge moment um, uh, in the national uh, sort of consciousness when she does go. As you say rightly, there are people. Three generations have seen her face on the money, <laughs> and she's always been there. Uh, and she's, you know, when she's gone, it will feel like a massive identity crisis. But, you know, there isn't a great movement in England to get rid of the monarchy. The monarchy at the moment, unless something uh, major happens, which does constantly and could really change things. I mean, it's, it's a volatile world we live in now, so it's not a given. But people are uh, attached to the monarchy as the link to their history in England, uh, their national uh, identity, pride, uh, a sense that if you don't have the monarchy, is England any bigger for losing it? The answer is no. You know, if there's no monarchy in the in England, a massive piece of English kind of uh, appeal, if you like, has been further diminished uh, for certainly for for for, for the overseas for uh, a sense that the country shrunk again. You know, uh, without it. Um, so that I don't think is is a, is a big movement. I do think it's going to be very hard though for Charles because you know there's no particular uh, sort of interest in Charles from the younger generation. Um, he will be a transitional monarch. He's already 73. His role really is going to have to kind of try to modernize and get things in shape, you know, for William. And, and what kind of monarchy will it be for William? And, you know, William and Kate are a much more sort of low-key, relatable uh, uh, sort of, you know, impact in the world. I mean, they're, they're, they're popular, very popular in the UK, but People aren't, you know, I mean, I think they're going to have to work hard to sort of retain the interest and 
and give the sort of gravitas and stature to the, to, to the institution, which the Queen has given. I mean, no one can match her for gravitas. I mean, her first prime minister she knew was Winston Churchill. And, you know, I mean, the rings of history around the Queen are, are so incredible that, you know, she represents the nation's you know, modern history. So that obviously will never be true of, them, of her successors, of, of Charles or of, or of William. I actually think William, Charles will be a good uh, sort of set, uh, transitional king. I mean, he, he did uh, have all of these passions of long ago, which have turned out to be very important ones. Namely, you know, his care for the environment, his concerns about climate change, his passion for organic farming, all the things that he was mocked for in decades past now suddenly seem absolutely relevant. So it couldn't be a better moment for him, if you like, in terms of his his own, you know, collection of 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 of, of uh, concerns and passions, kind of meeting the the correct point in 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 the national sort of acceptance. But you know, Camilla is now popular. I mean, she's never going to be, uh, you know, uh, the kind of razzle dazzle beloved woman of, of of England. But she is very much respected and liked. You know, she's gracious. She's warm. She's been married to Charles longer now than Diana was, 20 years. She's shown that she can really do this royal role with great dignity. And so people like Camilla, but it's much more um, a question, I think, of how things, you know, how, how they comport themselves essentially in the next few years. They've got a chance to, to have a good transitional monarchy. In will come William. And then it's really for William to, um, to sort of try to figure out how to be a modern king, which is not an easy challenge. Right, unprecedented, um, and it'll be interesting to see because obviously Charles, um, his his time will inevitably be very short um, as a man in his seventies. So it's um, for those of us who watch this family, we have a lot to keep watching, and I hope you keep chronicling it, Tina, because it is you just have a fascinating insight and view into this family. I love, love, love this book. Thank you so thank you. so oh much gosh. for talking to me. Very, it's very happy. It's thank an you. absolute pleasure, and again, thank uh, thank you so much for your time and congratulations. Congratulations on its success. It's a pleasure. Come back and talk to us anytime. Next time in the studio, though, okay? Thank you. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Bye, Tina.